Hello and welcome to the webinar on stink bug management with trap cropping by Russell Mizell of the University of Florida. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and recorded webinars about organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Dr. Russell Mazel is a professor of entomology at the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, North Florida Research and Education Center, located in Quincy, Florida. He has 42 years of experience in developing IPM strategies and tactics for deciduous fruit, pecan, forest, and ornamental arthropod pests. He is the inventor of the yellow pyramid stink bug trap, as well as a deer fly trap, and he's made numerous other contributions to sustainable pest suppression. So now I'm going to hand over the screen controls to you, Russell, and in just one moment you'll have the control, and then just click on your screen once again to activate it. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, we have a pretty tall order today with the uh, breadth of, uh, of expertise and background of the audience and the limited amount of time that we have to discuss a pretty broad subject, and that is uh, implementing trap crops. So, uh, and, and also the broader uh, conceptual ideas behind that, which is basically manipulating the habitat structure and function. So. The subheading of this is putting the ecosystem to work, and the, the uh, subject matter uh, in brief overview you see on the screen there. Uh, probably most people aren't going to be able to assimilate this in, a, in the time that we have a, allowed. Uh, it's probably virtually impossible, and I don't expect you to do that. What I tried to do here was to hit all the uh, subject matters that I thought were important, so I suggest that uh, you sit back and, and listen to me and watch the slides. I will not uh, read the slides. I will not talk about all the points on the slides, but I wanted to make sure that that handout that you got to, that went along with the, with the recording that you'll uh, want to see later will be as complete as possible. So we're going to talk about stink bugs, biology, ecology, behavior, monitoring, and ultimately get to the payoff, which will be using trap crop. OK, uh, the first question that I've been asked when I've talked about this was, well, how applicable is this uh, across the country? Uh, everybody say, well, yeah, we'll give you the southeast, but what about the rest of the places? And the principles are going to be the same. I'm going to I'm going to tell you what I know, and I think what you you'll need to know, and you'll have to apply it. Certainly, I think that that it's going to work with some tweaking wherever you are in the United States. And my contention for that is that uh, stink bugs and and related species are scattered all over the place. They they fill similar niches. While the behaviors are differ in some way, there are a lot of similarities, so the principles are common among the species. And um, it, it just may be that, that you need to pick some other uh, more applicable species to develop your trap crops for your particular pest. But uh, most of them overwinter adult, as adults, so they're going to come out as adults. They're very prolificous. That means they have more than one host plant. They're, the underlying mechanism, as I'll explain, is, is really the quality of their food. They tend to move through the landscape. They're going to respond to the vegetation that they see. And as a result of that, you get a very strong edge effect from these guys uh, in their distribution. And they certainly have a lot of natural enemies that, that are worth uh, considering and augmenting. So. One of the problems is they're highly tolerant to insecticides. We don't really have a lot of knowledge for some species. And uh, there are not a whole lot of other, other tools available for them. So what we're going to be forced to do is to put together uh, things that we have that are going to give us a, a little bit of help here, a little bit of help there. And of course, that's what integrated pest management is about. And so we're used to that. But that's what we're up against. 
All right, so I'm just going to give you a little background here to start off with about what we're talking about. In the southeast, we have four major uh, stinker leaf-footed bugs that we're concerned about, the, the browns, the greens, the southern greens, and the leaf-footed bugs. Uh, all of the trap crops that, that I'm talking about attract these species along with a lot of these other ones that have, and, and you folks in different parts of the country certainly have other species that we don't have here. Maybe in, uh, there are other eucystis like conspersus on tomatoes in California, for example, and some of the other places that are well-known pests, but have a lot of the same, they might use the same pheromones or similar type behavior, which you can exploit. They also have common life cycle. And uh, if you're using pheromones, oftentimes you'll want to know the sex. And this slide tells you how to do that. You look at the, at the rear end. And there are other bugs that you're going to see in the same milieu when you're trying to target your pests. So that's something that you also need to be cognizant of. And you can, you can identify these things fairly well with pictures looking, at, looking up on the web. So that's, that's just something you're going to see. Now, stink bugs are not all bad. There are a lot of good stink bugs. There are a lot of predaceous stink bugs. And there are a lot of of other predators that look like stink bugs, they're close relatives like red of beas, which is this one down here on the right. And you will have different species wherever you're located as well. The way to tell the good ones from the bad ones is to hold them up by the backside, and hold them up by their posterior, and look at their head. If you compare the blue and the clear arrow here, the predators on the right. And if you can see a space between the mouth parts and the head, that's good. If you can't, that's bad. These are the guys that feed on, on leaves, uh, leaf material. So stink bugs also have lots of other na natural enemies, uh, parasites, uh, parasitic wasps attack the eggs, and those are um, the target of uh, classical biological control searches, which, which are, uh, are ongoing for the brown marmorated stink bug as we speak. And then the tachinid flies, which are known predators, actually lay their eggs right on the, the uh, adults or nymphs, and then the uh, larvae hatch out and bore right into the, to the host. So this is general biology of these guys. And the problem is, like I said, that, that we do not have a lot of insecticides that, are, that, are, uh, re that can replace, such as uh, PENCAP-M, which was a great killer of stink bugs. And the other problem is we don't have very efficient monitoring methods for some of the other species. So, uh, and we may not, actually. So when I, um, in my research, when I uh, thought about looking at this, uh, habitat manipulation was really the thing that, that attracted me. Uh, we have to put the ecosystem structure and function to work for pest suppression. and. Um, so what I wanted to do was to develop something that was scale and philosophy neutral, meaning that uh, conventional as well as organic growers or small farmers or homeowners could use the technology. And, um, and I also realized that we weren't going to have any such thing as a, as a silver bullet, so we were going to have to look at, at uh, many, of, many aspects of the problem in order to come up with a workable solution. Okay, so understanding bug behavior just as sort of as a, a brief overview before we get into this. You really need to know their seasonal abundance, when they're going to occur. You need to know about their food quality. Like I said, they're going to be moving. It's going to be at the landscape level. You're going to want to know what, what uh, the vegetation looks like, and that often winds up with this very strong edge effect that we see in stink bug distributions in crops. So in order to gather that information, you do have to have a good monitoring and detection system. It's really a must, and there are a lot of ways to do that, many of them labor intensive, and a lot of them not very statistically accurate or precise. But we have to use what we can. And one of the things that I came up with, of course, was the stink bug trap, which many of you are familiar with or have a patent on that. And it works very effectively with uh, with both visual cues and with pheromones. And we have a pheromone for the brown, and we have uh, a semiochemical that works with some, other, some of the other species. And uh, uh, at this point, there are uh, a number of these traps available. The key to that one happens to be the lid. 
or the or the capture device, the top, if you will, it needs to be well lit. That was the problem. They didn't want to go into the dark. And these are commercially available now through, uh, and this is just shows you where they can be set in a peach orchard. They are, uh, versions of them are available from AgBio, so if anybody has a hankering to buy some of these, they're available along with uh, the semiochemistry that goes with them. So, so, first question we need to discuss is temporal and spatial distributions. What we want to know is where the bugs are in time and space, because if we're going to manage them around your area, you're going to need to know where they're coming from and where they're going. So, in order to get at that question, a couple of colleagues and I set up some experimentation some years ago where we put out uh, uh, traps, my trap, with, with pheromone for the brown stink bugs, Eushista species on a, we had three one square mile plots and we had a 750 foot grid of traps and we looked at these for two or three years and I want to show you just briefly, this is the site, we had three of these sites and had a lot of different vegetation there, a lot of different crops growing, everything from just uh, grass to pecan to soybean, cotton, uh, vegetables, you name it, and, and those blue dots there are where the traps were. And this is just a, a brief presentation of one of the weeks of trap catch with the traps, and I just want to show you there that uh, the darker the color, the more stink bugs were trapped in that particular trap. And if if you look at this at four different times, you can see that the distribution is quite dramatically different. There's a lot of variation, and let me characterize this by saying, obviously the, uh, the bugs are not at the same place every time. They're not in the same number at the same place over time, and so they're moving around. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, that you need to deal with when you're sitting in one particular spot. So you can get um, a good data looking at these things with the trap catch. This is just an example that, that shows us uh, the brown populations, brown stink bugs over time. Uh, the, the nymphs show up. These are large, the late instar nymphs show up. So we look like we have three generations here, and we compare them on different crops, and you still get the same kind of phenology. They're just at different places at different times. So it does give you a unique perspective, which I think, is uh, really sheds some light on what we're trying to do here. It gets us to where, where we really need to be in terms of trying to use trap cropping. Uh, we haven't talked about what's really driving this yet, which we, we will do, but uh, certainly um, the stink bugs are, are moving around a lot. And, and the thing about it is there, uh, for the reason that we're going to go into here, the next, the next subject matter was that is the mechanism behind this. Uh, what's really driving this behavior, and how can we exploit it? And and one of the things that uh, most people uh, fail to understand, or are confused about, or maybe perhaps just don't want to believe it, but most people think that arthropods and stink bugs, case in point, are just everywhere. You know, they're just scattered over everywhere. And in fact, the opposite is, is true, that most insect populations are aggregated. And a lot of them are highly aggregated, as I showed you in some of those uh, pictures there. And they're aggregated for two reasons. One, to find food, and the other, to find mates. Or both of those reasons, depending upon the situation. So we're trying to exploit that. So we really need to know where they are in time and space at a farmscape level. And then we need to know how we're going to exploit that. And um, to do that, we're hoping that, that we, can, we can apply this knowledge and use trap crops strategically as a tactic to uh, reduce damage. Okay, so what's really driving the system, and the reason I use the word that word quality rather than quantity is that the insects uh, are very, very uh, persnickety, if you will. They're, they don't just accept any host, and they don't accept any host in any stage. 
And these next three slides are going to point that out to you. And what we have here is we have a lot of different crops planted. This happens to be triticale, which is a cross between wheat and rye. Most of you know that as a cover crop. Uh, and you can see here that, that uh, e-service, you shift to service and let the glosses, and down here at the, is the growth stage, only use that host plant during the milk stage and just prior to that. And in this, in this next one, we have sorghum. And you can see that in sorghum, the top one is Euschist uh, service, excuse me, on the sorghum. And then down at the bottom is Leptoglossus phallopus. And this demonstrates, again, that the, the, the stage of growth of the host plant is very important. They're only building up on it during the, the milk stage or, the, or the, the stages around that. And down here on uh, Leptoglossus phallopus, you can see that there actually is a difference between the immatures, which you see here in the pink, versus the adults. So the timing is just a little bit different there. And that can be very important when you're trying to attract bugs to a particular spot and maintain them there before they get into your, your cash crop. So again, three more bugs on millet, same, same result. And what that tells us is that food quality is extremely important. And extremely important from the standpoint that um, it's driving the system. There is a bit of difference between the stages. But uh, these guys are, are generalists, so to speak. So in entomology, preferences has kind of a, a special meaning with respect to host plant resistance and how uh, arthropods actually respond to their host plants and use their host plants. And um, many insects are, in fact, specialists. They only feed on uh, a single species or maybe a few species in a particular family of plants. But and, and with those insects, there's usually some kind of uh, chemical relationship, or I should say a plant-insect relationship based on the plant chemistry. And that's evolved in a co-evolutionary arms race over evolutionary time. And what we're seeing is the end product at this point in time. And uh, an example of that would be the crepe myrtle aphid. Now, a lot of, a lot of people don't have crepe myrtle. But crepe myrtle has an aphid on it. It's an exotic plant with an exotic pest. And crepe myrtle only gets on crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle aphids only, only feed on crepe myrtle. And it doesn't matter whether there's one or a one billion of them. They're only going to be feeding on crepe myrtle. And in fact, uh, that relationship seems to be so tight. And, there, and we know that, that crepe myrtle has a lot of alkaloids in it. And that relationship seems to be very tight such that the aphids are probably sequestering that chemistry. And um, they do not have any parasites attacking them that are known. And I published a paper on that one time and searched all around the world to try to find that. But, but that is the exact opposite of stink bugs. And, and I'm emphasizing this because, because when you're thinking about how these guys are using their hosts and what you need to do in order to have a really good trap crop, uh, you're going to have to make sure that your food uh, quality in your trap crop outcompetes your cash crop. Right? So it's very important. The other thing you have to do is, of course, have them in, in sequence. And we're going to talk about that. So, All right, uh, just as a, as a background of, and some support, information is is that if you read the literature, the literature is there that, that really supports what we're doing and, and the things that I'm telling you here and, and the huge potential that habitat manipulation provides us relative to, to uh, pest suppression. And it really has not been uh, utilized to its potential to date, but it certainly is uh, supported with theory. And one of the one of the best papers that I that I that I can recommend to you uh, is this one here, which I'm not going to go over uh, in detail with all this stuff, but it was a simulation study. It's the only paper that I'm aware of where actually behavior, the, the pest skill behavior and the habitat manipulation strategies and tactics were, 
were compared and contrasted, and uh, the results of this paper. This paper came out about halfway through this work that I'm reporting on, and, and I was very gratified to find out that it supported everything that I was hoping and thinking. So I strongly recommend that paper. Now let me summarize what we've done so far. We've talked about some behavior, the fact that, that you really need to understand that. Of course we need to know the seasonal abundance because you're going to be planting planting your cash crop at different times depending upon your location. You might double crop. All these things are going to be very important as to try to, as you will see, to, to try to implement trap cropping and, and to have it work effectively for you. So I think I've demonstrated that food quality is the mechanism. Certainly the where the insects are in time and space is important. We haven't talked much about structure, but but you'll have to take my word for it that there is a very strong edge effect manifested by these insects when they move through the landscape. And if anybody's out there working with brown marmorated stink bug, then you've probably heard about how uh, soybeans in soybean fields there's always a, a ring around the the edge of the soybean field in the fall that remains green. And where the insects have fed on the seeds, there's a border there. And then on the interior of the crop, it basically has not been damaged, and, and it, go ahead, it goes along and senesces as it normally would. So it manifests a very strong edge effect, even by the huge populations that we see from brown marmorated stink bug. So with this background, then, how are we going to exploit this thing? All right, just what is a trap crop? Well, this is what it is, and hopefully it'll have these characteristics. We're just going to have a, a much smaller area. You're going to have hosts that outcompete the cash crops. We want it to be a doable, can't be expensive. We want to place it strategically. I hope you remember that word because you must intercept the stink bugs before they get into your cash crop. You're not going to be able to pull them back out. Once they get in there, a pheromone won't do it because for most of them, food quality, that's what they're looking for, and maybe mates come secondary or at least uh, along with it. So you must have these things established to intercept the stink bugs. And we don't want to be putting stuff out there that causes more problems than, than we have. And so that means that we have to be able to, to plant them and some other things that I'm going to talk to you next. Uh, there's no reason why trap crops can't be combined with other tactics that, that we'll talk about. And hopefully, we should be able to do this for all growing seasons. And down here in the southeast, that's much of the year, if not all year, in, in, with many crops, uh, many, many producers. So. Here's what we're trying to do. Basically, you're going to grow a, a cash crop at some time during the year. My example here in the black is, let's say we're going to grow a cash crop in June, July, and August, or more than one as far as that goes. And we're going to need to bracket that crop with one or more trap crops that are going to outcompete the cash crop for, for feeding from the stink bugs. So how are we going to do that? One of the things to remember is that the plants that you use have a natural uh, growth period. Uh, you plant them at various times of the year and they go through their maturation period and, and you harvest them. And that's the same thing to do. I mean, that's the same characteristics you're going to find of any plant that you use in the trap crops as well. But this is a bane and a boon. In this case, we can, we can get around that with, with some, uh, some slick thinking, I think, that we, we can exploit this to, to make it work for us. So the ideal features would be that we have lots of stink bugs out there, lots of pests, so it, we would hope that it would, it would attract all of them. And I, as I, I presented the four major ones, the, one, the, the trap crop plants that I'm going to recommend and talk about a little bit do attract all of those species as well as many other ones. These, the seeds are available, and this is where you get into whether you, whether you strictly use native plants or not. In the case of, of strictly relying on natives, there's, there's problem finding plants. If you're organic, there'll be problem finding or, uh, organic 
certified plants, it's a real problem. Uh, the, you need to be able to grow them. I mean, if you can't grow the trap crop economically and have it available when you need it, then it's not going to do you much good. And, and like I said, we don't want to have uh, side effects or actually bring in other pests that are, gonna, that are going to uh, uh, cause even more damage. The other thing uh, is, is that we need, uh, we need to, to be cognizant of the different maturity times and uh, if we pick plants that have different maturity dates, so there's a range in cultivars, that's very good. I'll talk a little more about this next one about retuning, which is just mowing. Uh, from a behavior standpoint, uh, height of the trap crop can be important as a barrier. So, uh, we're, we're working on that. There's a lot of folks interested in that. So that can that could could be a uh, an an extra characteristic, as well as uh, I I exploitable, and uh, and multiple tactics. The other thing that I really like about this, and and the reason why we settled on some of the plants that we have, is that these plants are important multifunctionally. They enhance beneficials. They enhance pollinators. They're seeds for wildlife. So such things as, as sunflowers are uh, very important for beneficials, pollinators, uh, wildlife is a perfect example for that. Buckwheat is a miracle crop, miracle crop, easily, easily available, easy to plant, very fast. We'll talk some more about that. And I did make some comments previously about native versus exotic plant use. Bottom line is that you're going to have something. You're going to have to use something that works. That's what you want to do. You're not going to go to all this trouble, and then uh, let yourself open to failure. So here's the kind of things that we've talked about this a little bit, but you need to know what your host plant range and phenology is because you're going to compare your cash crop. Like I said, you're going to grow the cash crop. And you're going to have to bracket the growth of the trap crop. You want to know where the insects are. If they're coming from inside your crop, you can't let them get inside your crop. You have to, you have to keep them outside. You have to inter intercept them. You want to know where they're coming from. So you need to know about their behavior, their movement behavior, and their behavior are the natural enemies that uh, you're going to exploit. So I've talked about this as kind of a summary of that. We don't have many insecticides. There are a few that do have uh, some incremental mortality. Uh, you can add in some of these other things, uh, but we want to we want to combine as many tools as we can in an economical approach that will do the job that we need to do. So the scheme that I've come up with, and I'm recommending. Uh, one of the problems that we had was the cold weather in the spring. Uh, a lot of plants, as everybody knows, don't grow very well with cold feet. And down here even, uh, it's very difficult to have things growing at a rate fast enough to bracket a cash crop in early spring. So one of the things you can do is, is what people are doing with cover crops and such, and that is would be to plant them in the fall and plant things like triticale, which is a very good, uh, very good host of, of a lot of stink bugs. And if you combine that with crimson clover and then a hairy or common vetch, then in the spring they'll be ready to go and be on uh, time with your cash crop. Now one of the things you can do because we have problems in the southeast with early freezes, early spring freezes, or late spring freezes, what have you. So if you stagger your plantings in the fall, then you will have uh, one of your plots will probably be able to survive whatever the catastrophes are, whatever the vagaries of weather are, and you'll be set up uh, with your when you plant your cash crop. And then in the spring, you can come in with this if you need if if you need other plants to really make the thing work, then you can add in sunflower and buckwheat and some of these other things that, that I'm recommending here. And then for the spring and fall, you have a, a much greater palette of things to choose from. But um, it's just, 
you can see when you look at these plants that uh, there are a lot of a lot of these like sorghum, sunflower. I have a lot of different cultivars. They have a lot of different physical characteristics. Triticale even has a, uh, comes in varieties with a with a great deal of variation in height, all the way from say uh, about a foot foot and a half in height, all the way up to three or four feet, or even even taller than that. So when you think of the physical properties and also the color varies, which you'll see in some of my slides. So that's something else that uh, there's less information on, but certainly is important. There's lots of information that have been published on sunflowers and buckwheat relative to their value to beneficials, to pollinators. Uh, for example, uh, field, one of these field peas and okra, uh, they have uh, extra floral nectaries, which parasites love to feed on. Beneficial uh, predators feed on those. Lots of insects feed on those. And we also have different maturity times, like sorghum. For example, has a, a wide range of maturity anywhere from I think the shortest one somewhere in the 50 days all the way up to 70 or 80 days. And some of these plants are amenable to to mowing, which is a was a very useful tactic, and and they don't have a lot of side effects, which is what we're trying to do. So the one the one really uh, really good feature of this, which I'm going to demonstrate even better in the next slide, but uh, retuning or just mowing, what we're talking about is uh, once the trap crop heads out and the insects feed on that, and that usually is maybe anywhere from, uh, say, two, three weeks in buckwheat to a couple more weeks, even longer than that, uh, maybe three or four weeks for sorghum and millet, and sunflowers. Um, and then once the insects uh, deplete those, then you can come in and mow it down to about half a meter or half a yard high, a couple feet high, and then what happens is the the plant then starts to grow again and uh, heads out again. And what happens is is that the uh, each of the uh, the germplasm uh, is the the, the uh, genome is of uh, the individual plants is then meta manifested, and what you get is plants in all different states because their maturity is then uh, a change. Their maturity date is changed, and so unlike when you plant them initially and they head out, all it, become mature at the same time uh, relative to that cultivar. When you mow them back, they express their individuality, and when you think back to what I told you about the food quality. Well, then that's the best of all worlds because you want to have a whole bunch of host plants there in different stages maturing at different times, and it's, that's the beauty of doing this. And if you're an organic grower and you're going you're gonna to have certified land and you have to grow these plots at the same place all the time anyway, if you can figure out where to strategically place these things and then be able to plant uh, multiple uh, cash, or maybe you're double cropping or something like that, but you can have your trap crops strategically placed and you can manage those so that they bracket a much longer period of time, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in this next slide, which says, okay, if you, this is, this is exploiting the retunability as well as the difference in maturity date of sorghum cultivars. So what I'm saying here is the first cultivar is a fast mature it comes in the head, and this gold is where the stink bugs use it. And this is your variation here. Of course, this is hypothetical, but it's doable this way. It may not be this, this clean, but it certainly is doable. Uh, you retune it. It takes a couple, three weeks for that to come back in head, and then that lasts. And so instead of having your trap crop last from the beginning here of the first cultivar to the end of the fourth cultivar, you now go from the beginning of the first cultivar all the way to the end of the retuning of the fourth cultivar. And so you get all this extra time, uh, which reduces the amount of plantings you need and, and your input. Okay? And on top of that, then I'll just reiterate that if also if these were different colors or different heights, uh, there's lots of possibility here for creativity and targeting specific needs for specific pests in your specific location. 
Okay, so this is kind of what we look like. Uh, Russ, where do we put them? We put them where we need to put them. We got to intercept them. These are the test plots that we use. We were using very small plots on the edge of this. I'll talk about this data. I just want to show you what we're doing here. Uh, uh, you can see that we had some small plots here, about a meter by 10 meters on a, this was uh, some organic soybean that we were protecting with, a, with our test. I'll talk about that data some more. Uh, here's me and my, from my best perspective uh, walking down the road so you can get some idea of what this stuff looked like early on. Uh, it later grew very tall to form a barrier by the time the pods were on the soybean. So, and this is, uh, now I'm going to just go quickly through the individual species. Uh, Triticale, and, and you all uh, can read this at your leisure. I just want to demonstrate what they look like and the variation here that you might exploit. And over here in the, in the features I have uh, things like uh, whether beneficials get on them, uh, whether they retune, whether they have pollinators, what have you, when to plant them, that sort of thing. So I'm not going to I'm not going to call that out on all of them. I'm just going to say uh, just go over a few things. Like I said, buckwheat is really a, most farmers are going to know about buckwheat. It's really a miracle plant because it's easy to grow, it's easy to get, it's cheap, it grows very fast. And it does the job, many, many different jobs, from enhancing beneficials to uh, green manure to uh, augmenting parasitoids and, and capturing stink bugs. Uh, sorghum is another great plant. Most of you know about that. You can, uh, millet is also a, a great plant. Uh, it has uh, large number of cultivars that you can choose from like sorghum does. Like those sunflower, there's so much written about sunflower and it's, it's used by, by stink bugs, by pollinators, by wildlife, you name it. And it's a native plant. So it's a great plant to use for lots of different things. There's another one called uh, Japanese millet, which is a little, little uh, weedier species, but it, it also works. Uh, other species with potential are field peas and okra. The problem with field peas is that it grows so low. Maybe you can, grow, you can find some runner varieties of this, climbing varieties. You can put them on a trellis and it would probably be better. It does have extra floral nectaries and so does okra. The problem, uh, you don't want side effects. So with okra, sometimes they, they will cause uh, root knot nematodes. So that's one of the things. And you can put these in containers. So that may be one way to get around that. Uh, other ones that people have either considered or I've considered or I've looked up in the literature that I don't particularly care much for are these, hairy indigo, hemsesbania, and crotillaria. I don't recommend those at all, although hairy indigo is a really good cover crop uh, as far as green manure goes, but it does have some, some weediness, and so does this brown top millet, which, I, which is good for wildlife, but I don't really recommend that you use that. Now, one of the things you can do, particularly homeowners, uh, backyard folks and organic growers or small farmers, you can actually put these things in containers. And uh, you can use, if you've got a greenhouse, you can start them early in the spring and, uh, and bring them out and strategically place them around your crop. Uh, one of the things you can do is use these yellow traps to enhance the stink bug attraction as well as your beneficials. I have another paper on that. So this, just summar this slide just summarizes what I've just told you there and all the things that you need to do to implement this. I want, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, some other things, I've talked about uh, physical barriers and physical properties of the trap crop. Uh, height is certainly something that needs to be considered. The configuration of the plants uh, something that uh, you can work with, but one might uh, just common sense in quotes might go from the shortest to the tallest from the edge to the toward the trap crop and uh, the density of the trap crop plants and the size of these things is really uh, the, the food quality is much much more important you really don't need a huge plot here you're talking about a very small strategically placed uh, uh, planting and, and I did mention the, the trellising one of the things you're going to you, you want to do if, if, if it need be is to exploit the, the visual components of it 
and uh, we have not looked at things like uh, adding visual repellents or visual attractants other than the yellow traps to it, or adding other artificial materials to actually have uh, such thing as a netting or a real barrier within the trap crop to try to enhance it, uh, its uh, function. Now, I'm sure a lot of folks on the webinar, listen to the webinar, are, are mainly concerned about marmorated, brown marmorated stink bug, and, and I'm sure everybody's aware that it is in a, it's an extremely important invasive pest. It gets in people's uh, uh, houses and dwellings as well as attacking their plants, and there's uh, several major projects underway conventionally and organically from a conventional and organic perspective. Uh, people are looking at trap crops. That's certainly uh, a huge part of the research that's going on, and, and a lot of them uh, have already been tested, and a lot of growers uh, are, are using them with some success. So that's uh, to, to be determined. But the principles that I've told you today are certainly going to apply. Uh, we do have some other tools, the trap the traps and some semiochemicals that, that are important. The unusually high populations uh, are going to impact the way this thing works, but uh, we really need to be concerned about uh, where we place these things, and that's, that and the food quality is really the, the, are really the driving variables. So uh, this is an example of, of some folks in another test planting uh, sunflowers, which is an excellent trap crop, down the middle of a, of a planting of squash and tomatoes. And um, what happened here was, and you see buckwheat at the end of the, of the row here, and what happened is, is the stink bugs came here and they built up on these sunflowers. And then if you remember what I told you about the movement and the edge effect and what have you, then you can anticipate what I'm about to tell you. What this represents is just a roadway to the interior of the crop. Whereas this, had this been planted in a small plot on the outside, they would have stayed there or they could have been removed from there before they moved into the cash crop. But by planting this as an intercropping as opposed to a trap crop, then you get this, this uh, infestation. So where you are and how you're going to tweak this thing, this is, the, this is what you have to remember. You're going to have, your, you're going to have your, your trap crops, and you're going to have your cash crop, and they're going to be configured in some way. If you don't know anything about the default position, obviously, is to plant a trap crop around the whole thing. And that's been done in a lot of situations. But I would contend that if you really truly understand your target pest, that that's not going to be necessary. For one thing, if you have a lot of open fields around it versus um, other commodities, uh, woods, what have you, where the insects might be coming from, then the, then the strategic placement would be to plant your, your trap crops between the source and the sink. Because as, remember, you have to intercept them. So you can't pull them back out, so you, gotta, you have to intercept them. But they're not going to... They're aggregated to where they're going to find their food, and they're not going to cross open fields. They just don't want to do that. I mean, it's not to say that they can't or they won't, but their tendency is not to. They're going to follow the structure, and that's why you see the edge effect, and that's what you're exploiting here. And they're going to move, let's say, if they were coming over here uh, from the upper right-hand corner and heading south, they're going to intercept the source here at the top. They're going to follow the edge of that thing, and that's going to direct them right into your trap crop. They're not going to go way over here out in the out like, like, and, and, and subject themselves to the risk of predation or losing their host plant. All right? So this is, the, this is what you have to do. This is the default position on the left, a lack of knowledge, and as you develop your knowledge and expertise and confidence, you're going to go... To, to this type of configuration. Okay, this is the data from the uh, organic soybeans. We had about a two-acre soybean field. You can see that this we planted trap crops on the edge. This is what was on the trap crop. This is what was in the, in the soybeans. We did a very good job. 
this was just in a test plot, so with some very small plots. We're getting close to the end here. The, uh, one of the final questions would be, well, once you got them in the trap crop, and let's say we're just great and we do have them there, well, we got to move them. We got to get them out of there. So what are we going to do there? Because if there's not any insecticides, or uh, we don't want to use insecticides because we're going for this multiple function of, of enhancing beneficials, pollinators, what have you, then what are you going to do? Well, believe it or not, a lot of these are very amenable to sweet nets or just picking them off by hand or vacuum device. Uh, we came up with and tested just uh, all you're doing here is just making a, a PVC frame and putting some uh, cloth and net over it and then you get yourself a, a leaf blower or something like that and walk behind the trap crop and blow them into this net and they fall down in here and you can pick the stink bugs out and the beneficials and everything will just fly out and you can remove them that way. It works pretty well. But it is it is labor intensive and this is this is very much a uh, negative side of using trap crops. All right, we're pretty close to the end here. What I'm doing now in my research is trying to uh, utilize the core plants that we have here in multifunctional plots so that we can augment ecological services. And ecological services, without going to a lot of detail or just what I've been talking about, is what the it's what the ecosystem does for you. We're putting it to work. We're, we're enhancing pollination. We're enhancing predation, parasitism. We're getting aesthetics from our butterflies. We're enhancing our wildlife. And we're trap cropping stink bugs. So we're utilizing these functions and trying to augment them. That brings me to the end, folks. I hope you had, uh, I hope this uh, uh, gives you the, the enthusiasm and confidence to try this. Uh, there's nothing more fun than, than entomology, and I hope that uh, I've extended some of that enthusiasm to you today, and, and I'll be glad to uh, take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Russell. Um, we'll be starting our question and answer session in just a moment, and for anyone who missed the very beginning of the webinar, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and then hit return. If you don't see the question box, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question, and that will open it up. Um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted to the extension.org website under Upcoming and Archived Webinars. And um, here's the link right here. Um, if after the webinar you have additional questions, um, you'll, you're welcome to contact Russell um, about stink bug trap traps. Um, but if you have also general questions about organic farming, you're welcome to use the eExtension Ask an Expert service. And I've got the link on your screen. I'll be putting Russell's email back in a moment in case you didn't get that or his website link. So um, I just want to keep this on the screen for just a moment. Um, so we, I just want to say before we start the questions that we really value your feedback on our webinars. So we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So now I'll move on to the first question. Actually, the first question is a com starts with a comment. And that is that in the Pacific Northwest, um, buckwheat is a major attractant, attractant to several important pest species. Um, for example, imported cabbage worm and lightest bug. So um, your talk is focused on stink bug management, but Regionally, shouldn't we also be thinking more holistically in terms of pest management? Uh, that's a very good comment. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that's that's the that's why uh, it's important to consider more than one uh, species of plant for your trap crop, and really to select them uh, with with knowledge about what side effects could possibly be. We definitely do not want side effects, but on the other hand, uh, there are certainly um, and I, I'm no authority on the insects that you mentioned, the other pests, but certainly there are organically uh, certified uh, chemicals that you could use to control. So if, if you're actually concentrating them in the trap crop, then I, I think that's uh, worth a, a look at whether it, you might be able to exploit that to suppress those as well. Okay. Um this is a question about brown marmorated um, stink bug. What trap crops were tested for them? Uh, there have been a, a several that uh, growers have, have uh, spoken about and, and had fair success with. There, there's, not ha there's not been a great deal of, uh, of uh, what I would say, uh, quantitative testing um, other than just okay, we, we did or we didn't have it, and uh, we had less damage. But those happen to be uh, things like uh, sunflowers, uh, 
pumpkins, some of the other cucurbits. Uh, they love those those pumpkins and some of the squash uh, and cucurb and um, uh, sunflowers. And I've probably forgotten some other ones, but uh, uh, there are some folks that are that are working on brown marmorated that can fill you in on that. Um, the potted plantings that you showed of um, trap crops were not very dense. How many um, rows of these or how many pots are needed? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. One of the things you can use those for is to monitor as well. Uh, you really don't need that many. I mean, it's um, the insects are running around looking for food. If, if, uh, if you get them in the right uh food quality, they're going to go to them and they're, they're going to get on them. And you can certainly enhance those with multiple species and you can enhance them with the visual cues and you can also put pheromones on them as well to enhance their, uh, their function and, and if certainly they have uh, a specific use to small acreage or, or folks who, who don't really have the space to, to make uh, plantings in the ground. Okay. Um, let's see, here's some questions about what you do with the stink bugs once they're trapped. So uh, well, you step words, on you them. you <laughs> remove them or kill them? <laughs> yeah, you're just going to have to get rid of them one way or the other. Uh, they're good compost. <laughs> okay. Um, here's a question about where they usually overwinter. Uh, stink bugs, the ones that we have here in, um, in terms of um, the brown, the southern green, and the green, they all, and the leptoglossus, they overwinter as adults. You can find them under uh, the bark of trees. You can find them uh, sometimes in buildings. They'll be in the, the duff, uh, in pine needles and, and uh, leaf leaves and those kinds of things uh, on the ground and around. Uh, a lot of them under old trees with shaggy bark. Okay. Um, in the case of established orchards, like um, peach orchards, what should a grower do if he or she does not have the space around the orchard to put the trap crop? Well, you're going to have to go back to my last slide to see if this is a feasible thing to do. Uh, if you're growing organically, you're not going to have a lot of, of choice with other tools anyway. So what you have to do, or if you gave that back to me, I'll go back. Um, okay. Go back further. Let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more. Okay. One more. Okay. <laughs> that was Keep one going. One. <laughs> okay. There. Right there. Okay. So, so you really should. Uh, I would say, okay, take the view that you're up, you're up a thousand feet, and you're looking down on your property, and uh, take the, the, uh, the picture to the right, and figure out where they're going to be coming from into your orchard and you should have unless you, I mean if you have open fields uh, on certain sides of, of your orchard then those I would I would give much lower uh, probability of, of uh, having stink bugs come that from there or enter in that area they're going to enter they're going to enter the pathways are going to be whatever is closest to the edge of the orchard where they can skip and jump from. They don't want to go through the open. They actually, uh, Glenn Tillman will tell you that they have a higher uh, tendency to go down a corn row than across a corn row. That's how concerned they are about putting themselves in the open. It has to do with their perceptual range. They can't see very far. And, uh, and the analogy for that is if I put you in a boat and, and rowed you out uh, 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 from the coast, as long as you can see land, you're okay. As soon as you can't see land, then you're lost. And if I rotate you around a few times, you won't know which direction you're going. You're completely lost, and that's what happens to them. And what happens is it increases their probability of mortality, you know, death, and so they don't go that way. So, so that's the rule that you would you would use to determine where you need to to try to utilize these plantings. It's, it's pretty much that simple. You have to intercept them. Okay. Um, here's a, another comment um, about considerations when establishing a trap crop. 
Um, you'll also need to consider water to keep a crop going during the drought, um, weeds that could take over the trap crop, and um, predation or feeding by wildlife, for example, deer, rabbits, etc. Uh, yes, that's, that's very true. We have okay. very little, uh, very little uh, cultivation in the southeast that doesn't use irrigation, so that's, that is special to, to my experience. That's true. Very good comment. Here's another comment that says um, someone had 26,205 in their house last winter. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, have a, uh, I have a mother and a, and a sister that live in western Maryland, and, and they have about that many in their house. And uh, even though I'm an entomologist, I still get the brunt of the criticism. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on that, okay? <laughs> Okay. Um, here's a question about whether you know of any kind of plant that could reduce the movement of stink bugs or affect them somehow. Well, they're all. They're, I mean, that's basically the, what they're doing. They're they're arresting. The stink bugs are being arrested by the host plant, and uh, the the better food you have there, the less they're going to move. And so, I mean, that's basically what we talked about. All those things that I talked about: the color, the barrier part of it. Uh, the food quality is extremely important, and uh, and and probably the uh, the diversity of the plants would also also be important. And and this is all. And I don't think I, I commented about this, but certainly if you have like the last person was saying, twenty six thousand in one house. Well, the brown marmory the stink bug is just at astronomical numbers relative to our natives, and certainly, you know, expect to have one. One tool, no matter how good it is, to uh, intercept uh, population, all of the population at that when it's at that level is is unrealistic. Uh, there, there are two two things you need to remember, though, uh, with this, and that is that uh, hardly you're you're never going to find all the stink bugs on one host. They're not specialist to the extreme, and also you're never going to find every plant have a stink bug on it. So with those two extremes, then, that's what we're working with. We're trying to find the plants that most attract the stink bugs and keep them there and arrest them. And the other thing to do with that, of course, is, is to add these other tactics, add the visual cues, add the, the uh, chemicals that attract them and arrest them um, to keep them there until you can remove them. So that's what you're up against. Okay, here's another comment um, about what to do with stink bugs. Feed them to the fish. <laughs> uh, yeah, that works. <laughs> okay, um, here's a question about um, backyard gardens. Um, that the bugs are so small that virtually the uh, well, the backyard gardens are so small that virtually the entire garden is um, edge habitat that brown marmorated stink bugs can travel across. Ha have any of the trap crops actually been tried in backyard gardens? Um, I I don't know. But, uh, that they have um, certainly the organic growers that I've come in contact with, and probably some of them are on on the uh, call today, uh, have fairly small acreages and uh, very difficult situations where they're trying to to keep them out of their out of their of, uh, their cash crops. So again, I I just say that uh, they're looking for specific uh, things to feed on, and if you put them between wherever they're coming from and where you don't want them to go, you're going to intercept them. And that's basically just the cardinal rule. Have good food that they come in contact with before they get in your garden. Otherwise, you're going to have to control them inside the garden. Um, was that just a yellow painted plastic pole um, that was in the potted trap crops that you yeah. showed the pictures of? That yeah. Well, what we, I, 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 yeah. Actually, there. I'm not sure that it's still there, but I gave a uh, a uh, presentation at the Entomological Society of America a couple years ago, and they actually recorded it, and it was up on the web. I'm not sure it still is, but what we did there was we compared different size and shaped yellow traps for their attraction of beneficials. You can think of this as a gazing ball. It just happened to be yellow, and what we found was that a seven inch, seven, I mean seven inch, a seven gallon or five gallon yellow plant pot, a seven gallon or five gallon plant pot painted yellow about a meter or so off the ground was just 
uh, equivalent to a three inch by three foot long mailing tube if they were pl if they were painted a bright yellow which that is and we use safety yellow which is one that that's that's used for uh, just like I said it's a certified uh, safety paint uh, and you can use those and they will enhance your beneficials uh, lady beetles by somewhere between 2 and 5x something like that they will also be attracted to the to photophagous insects and uh, and they will enhance uh, the workings of whatever you're trying to do there. You can actually put those on a pole and stick them over your roses and if you have aphids on them you'll enhance the beneficials on, on your roses or whatever else in your yard that you're, you're trying to control. It just, what it does is basically it just enhances the active distance of uh, where you of that particular spot otherwise. So the ins let's say the insects can see three feet away but if you put that big yellow thing up there, they can actually see six or eight feet away. So what? So now you're going to just intercept more of the insects that are flying through the landscape because they can see it from further distance away. So you're actually concentrating them in to a smaller spot. Is basically what you're doing with that visual attraction. Okay. Um, on a larger commercial scale, how does one remove the stink bugs from the trap crown? There are there are no magical ways. There are nothing hidden. I told you everything that I know. <laughs> that means you're either going to have to spray them, or you're going to have to pick them off, or blow them off, or vacuum them off. There's there's absolutely no other way that anybody that I'm aware of has used or developed, or uh, effectively. So. Okay. But if you can get them there, uh, it's going to be a lot easier. However you do it, it's going to be a lot easier to control them there in that smaller space than it is in the acreage. So. Okay. Um, what controls are being used in the countries where these bugs have originated? That's maybe the brown marmorated. Yeah, the brown marmorated. Well, actually, the brown marmorated is a pest in, uh, in its countries of origin in Asia. But uh, I'm not aware of any magic bullets over there either. I mean, they're using, they're using insecticides in China. Uh, they use a lot of insecticide in China, contrary to popular belief. Um, speaking of insecticides, are there any um, certified organic insecticides that you know that are that work well against? Um, uh, no, I, I really don't. I don't know of any. Uh, usually, uh, folks are worried about other pests as well, and so you know the, the old standbys. Spinosad and Trust and BT, and uh, they really don't have that much effect on stink bugs, if any. Okay. Um, do you know of any studies where parasites um, are augmented within a trap to manage stink bugs? Or within uh, not within not within a trap, no. But by using these using buckwheat and such, you're going to augment the the tachinids love buckwheat. You can find them on. Uh, and I'm, sh I'm sure that, uh, that there are other trap crops that the parasites like. There's some work being done at the University of Maryland. Those guys are looking at some plants uh, and uh, that enhance the egg parasitoids. And of course, we do have people for the brown marmorated searching in uh, that countries of origin for parasites of that one. And some have been identified; they just haven't been released yet. But I will say, as a side comment, that uh, we're probably not going to be able to hang our hat on biological control for these things. For some reason, maybe it's the same reason why insecticides don't work very well, is that, that uh, they don't have a very high level of natural uh, predators and parasites. We have several questions, um, both asking about whether um, there are any known repellent plants for stink bugs. I'm not aware of any. Uh, I, uh, anything that is not in the, f the food quality that they want is basically repellent, in quotes. Okay? If they don't like it, they're not going to stay on it. They, it, it, it. It's a matter of time. They'll probably alight on anything when they run into it because of this edge effect, but they're just going to keep on movement, moving. And so... Um, 
I know what you're asking. Are there things like uh, a neem or um, uh, anything like that? And, and people are looking at this, but I'm not aware of anything that uh, really has a, a, a lot of, uh, of uh, impact. And there may be folks doing it now. I don't know. I'm just not aware of it. I haven't seen anything in the literature. Okay. Um, here's a question about whether or not they're cyclical. Um, in the commentaries, we've had fewer over the years to almost none this year. So, yeah. uh, you're talking about stink bugs in general or brown marmorated? Um, um, I'm not sure. It doesn't say. Okay. Well, brown brown marmorated. Well, I'll just speak to those first. Brown marmorated uh, is an invasive species that's been around for 10 plus years, and it usually with invasive species, it for whatever reason, it usually takes about 10 years for them to really uh, get established and to reach high levels, which is why they are all, often here and well established before anybody ever knows they're here. But uh, it, it has definitely built up over the last 12, 15 years or so, and 2010 was a very high level. There were very high numbers of brown marmorated, whereas in 2011 there were, there were many, uh, they were much lower. Uh, but yes, insect populations in general do wax and wane for whatever reason. Uh, various reasons, many many reasons, abiotic, biotic reasons. Uh, certainly, the the classical work with uh, how uh, the 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 pest species builds up and the beneficials, uh, the, the parasites and predators, uh, then build up and get the best of them and suppress them again, and then they're eliminated. And so this is this is all very well known. So yes, they do, but that may not help you because within your <laughs> Your level of resolution, your backyard, the waxing and waning may not be very clear. Um, do you know how weather affects their presence? Uh, specifically, no. I mean, I, I couldn't say, uh, you know, well, if we get a thunderstorm, they're going to be less. Um, you know, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years, so something like that. Uh, Certainly, what you're going to see, for example, that, that would say, say uh, provide some information about that general question, would be that uh, in North Florida, uh, we've had a very, very warm winter, but we've had periods when we've had it very cold weather down in uh, the low 20s, and uh, the brown marmorade is probably going to probably going to respond like this. Uh, any insect that overwinters as an adult will usually uh, not hibernate in the classical sense. They, and stink bugs are, are uh, very much like this. They will go into, they will seek shelter when it's cold as the day length changes. And if you get hot weather, they'll come back out and they'll feed and they'll act uh, just normal. They may not uh, reproduce yet, and then when it gets cold, they'll go back into their uh, areas where they're uh, protected, and uh, they'll just keep doing that and wax and wane with the weather. Now, um, you know, if you get sudden colds or freezes and that sort of thing, it's definitely going to take a toll on them. You're definitely going to get mortality. And uh, if they get stuck out in a snowstorm or something like that, why? Well, it's probably not going to be good. Okay. Um, here's there's probably about three questions about whether or not there's any kind of host-specific plant attractants that one can put in trap crops to improve their performance, or whether um, volatile oils from damaged plants are also attractive to stink bugs. Um, so, and if, if you maybe know some sources on that. Right. This. Well, okay. So, this general area of of why the uh, why and how insects actually respond to specific host plants. Uh, is one of a uh, great deal of research. There are no silver bullets, as you might expect, because uh, uh, insects, insect species, all insect species don't feed on all plants. The world's green, but but the green isn't food for every, everything at the same time. There's uh, a lot of specificity out there, and so a uh, particular insect would be responding to a different chemical than another insect on another host plant. So there are no really magic bullets. There are a few things that have been identified that are attractants. Uh, carryoff, beta caryophyllene is one. Uh, methyl salicate is one that David James at uh, 
uh, in, in Washington's uh, discovered that actually attracts certain species of predators to an area you can concentrate them. Uh, Jeff Aldrich identified the pheromone from the uh, spine soldier bug and that's available commercially and that pulls in spine soldier bugs wherever you put that lure but the problem is, is a lot of these beneficials are not they're not specific to the pest that you're trying to control and uh, this is a very uh, in Un unspecific type of technology to use, and so the so the answer to your question is no. I'm not aware of any that you can, that you can use that are specifically going to attract Phytophagus plant feeding insects to a point source, which I think is what you were asking me. Are there just general things that you can put out? Now, when it comes to beneficials, if you want to get beneficials, you can spray sugar water. You can put sugar water out on a target plant, and I guarantee you they'll find it, and they'll stay there and eat it. And then any pest around there, they'll eat on that too. When what that is is just analogous to the honeydew being produced by by uh, Phytophagus insects anyway. So that's to be expected. But no, there aren't any magic bullets that I'm aware. And okay. and even the stuff that has been identified, it doesn't work every in in other places. It's very much host specific in many ways. So are stink bugs, do they um, move randomly until they encounter a preferred food source, or do, are they also attracted to odor as well as color? Oh, I think, I think uh, probably all of the above. Um, I don't think they're just flying around uh, at random. They're certainly following structure. There's, I mean, that's why you get the edge effect, and uh, they're, they're looking. We, we, we catch them in the yellow trap because they're, that, that basically is the, what a... Uh, a supernumerary host plant looks like. That's all we're doing is just mimicking the host plant. Most plant feeding insects do respond to bright yellow or, a, or some kind of a light green or something close to the foliage spectra that's being emitted. And so, so you get that. Um, uh, and so um, there is a certain amount of that, and uh, sting bugs would be much more directed, though. And, and this is one of the things that that paper I, I was talking about discusses: different kind of insects that that respond to host plants or move around the landscape in different ways. If you compare sting bugs, they're actually much more directed. They're flying towards structure and plants, as opposed to say aphids and thrips and mites and those kind of things, which are much more like aerial plankton, where they just get blown up in the air and they just go where, wherever the wind takes them and then they settle out of the air and they land wherever they land and if they land in the wrong place they're dead. If they land on a host plant then they're successful. Okay, I've got time for one last question and that is, is there any way or any time to destroy um, stink bug eggs? Uh, well, you can, they, they definitely oviposit on um, uh, specific host plants, they prefer other host plants. They're gonna, they're gonna use the the host plants to find food, and that's where most likely you're gonna find the eggs. And so you can find them and and destroy them. Yes, you certainly can. But it's <laughs> it's very time consuming. I mean, you have high like brown marmorated. I mean, you're gonna just get astonishing numbers of eggs being laid. So that's gonna be that's gonna be more than you can handle. Yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you for all your questions. And um, I just wanted to mention again that the recording of this webinar um, is going to be posted. Um, and there's a link on your screen where you'll be able to find it. Um, you'll have to wait a little bit until probably within the next several days um, the recording will be posted. And right now you can also go there and find the PDF handout of Russell's slides for this presentation. So you can go there um, right now and they should be there. So. Um, I want to thank you again, um, Russell Mazel, for giving this presentation and um, thank all of you for joining us. You're welcome.